For church, I'm going to ask you to take out your Bibles and open to the 14th chapter of the book of Romans. Whether it's electronic or in paper form, either scroll there or turn there. And as you're finding your place in God's word, I'm going to ask you to think back with me a generation or two. And those of you that can think back that long, and I'm going to ask you to tell me what these items have in common. Drums. Dancing. Long hair. Wine or alcohol. And hats or caps. What do you guys think? What is the common thread woven through each one? of those items. In this audience, half of you are too young to probably connect those dots. But some of us that have a little frost in the hair might be able to recognize and see the connection between those. What do you think? Anybody? <laughs> You're at a loss, huh, Christian? Yeah, no, no, no white hair in that mane, so, so, yeah. <laughs> well, at one point or another in the life of the church, each one of those things was considered worldly or unspiritual. And they were frowned upon in the life of the church. You agree, Joel? You can, you, you can remember that. Amen. Yeah, a Amen. Yeah, th th those things were considered unbecoming of a born-again Christian back in the day. Right? Churches didn't have drums. Our church doesn't have drums. Not because they're unspiritual, but because <laughs> we don't have anybody that knows how to play them. <laughs> so if there are any drummers out there, but, but, but church didn't have drums, right? And Christians didn't dance. In fact, my oldest son went to a Christian high school just recently, graduated just a few years ago, and they had socials, but they didn't dance. At the prom, there was no dancing allowed. What's a prom without dancing? I, I don't know what you call it. I, I, I have to ask, Micaiah, if you're watching, remind me, what did they call your prom if there was no dancing? So Christians didn't dance. Men didn't wear long hair, right? If you wore long hair, right, Steve? You had to cut your hair before you went to Pastor Howard's church. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so men didn't wear long hair. Wine and alcohol were considered the devil's brew, right? Not only you didn't drink it, I mean, you didn't even consider drinking it. And hat and caps were immediately removed the moment you set foot in the church. So you had to take off the hats and the caps. And so those are things that a generation or two ago were worldly and unspiritual and unchristian. And I'm sure there are other things that you can think of. Tattoos. Tattoos. Although scripture does have something to say about those, but we won't get into that right here, right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but there, there was and is and perhaps always will be things that are considered out of bounds in the church and among God's people. And in a sense, in the church, like in baseball, there were unwritten rules, things that you didn't do, things that you didn't possess, conducts, practices that you didn't engage in. Things, again, that were deemed unchristian or worldly. And that, that may never change. Because that goes all the way back to the first century. That's been an issue in the church ever since Paul's day. And in fact, the Apostle Paul addresses that in his letter to the church in Rome. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Because the Apostle Paul tackles the issue head on in Romans chapter 14, and so that's what we're going to look at today. 
Romans 14, we're going to read the first 13 verses. So follow along with me as I read. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account to himself, of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a, or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Our Father and our God, thank you for this word. Bless us now as we dive into it and seek to understand what it is you would have to say to us today as you spoke to your children those many centuries ago. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Here in chapter 14, Paul continues the applicational portion, the practical portion of the book of Romans. And here is another example of what it looks like to be that living sacrifice that the Apostle Paul uh, introduced back in chapter 12. And he continues to give us more examples of what it means and what it looks like to love one another as we love ourselves, which he touched upon in chapter 13. And so here, Paul is commanding us to do some things towards those that are called weak in the faith. Look again at verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. The first thing to note here in chapter, one, chapter 14, verse 1, is that the Apostle Paul acknowledges that not everybody is at the same place spiritually. There are different levels of spiritual maturity. Paul says here that some are weaker than others in their faith. And the Apostle, the Apostle John, if you recall in his first letter, the epistle of 1 John, he identifies some of these people and he calls some babes, while others he refers to as children. Some are young men and others are fathers. And so there's all different levels of spiritual maturity in the family of God. Not everybody is on the same plane. And that's because some people have been walking with the Lord longer than others. There are some that are more devoted to spiritual things than others. There are some that are less distracted by the world and the things of the world 
than others. And so as a result, there are going to be some that are stronger than others in their faith. There are going to be some that are better read. There are going to be some that are more familiar with the things that God allows. Those things that are neither immoral or unethical. What the theologians call matters of Christian liberty, which the Apostle Paul himself also addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And so, as for the one who is weak in faith, as for those that are not at the same level where you might be spiritually, the Apostle Paul tells us to welcome him and not to quarrel over opinions. Welcome him. That is, embrace him, accept him, receive him. Which means you're not to shun him, ridicule him, you're not to embarrass him or belittle him because that would not be loving your neighbor as yourself and it would certainly not be edifying to your fellow brother and sister in the Lord. Paul says not only to embrace him but don't quarrel over opinions. That is, there are some things that are not black and white. There are some things that are allowed that are not spelled out explicitly in Scripture. And so we are not to haggle with our brothers and sisters that have certain convictions that we might not hold. We're not to try to get people to loosen up or lighten up or grow up in their faith. We're not to try to convince them to meet us where we are but to allow people to grow at their own pace, right? Faith is like a muscle. It grows over time when it's exercised. And so the Apostle Paul commands, he doesn't suggest, he commands that those that are weak in faith are to be welcomed and not shunned. And then he gives us a for instance in verse two, an example of one who is weak in faith. Look at what he says in verse 2. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person only eats vegetables. Now, apparently, there were dietary practices and issues in the church at Rome. There were some who were vegetarians, and there were some people, Paul says, that eat anything. We might call these folks today foodies. People that liked food, that like to eat. When I, when I read this verse, I immediately thought of you, Christian. <laughs> because knowing you and your food, you eat just about anything, right? I, I, if, if you went to Ancestry.com, I bet you would find that you've got some Italian blood in you linked to this church at Rome. One of those that eat anything. And so there were Christians that had a very strict diet and there were Christians that had a more open diet that ate just about anything. Presumably they were eating meat. They were eating foods that were considered unclean or unkosher. And so the people that ate only veggies, Paul identifies them as being those who are weak in faith. Now, don't take offense. That's what the scripture says. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Now, does that mean that vegetarians are spiritually immature? I see somebody shaking their head. <laughs> are you a vegetarian? Most of the time. Most of the time? Okay, okay. Well, it could mean that. I mean, it meant that here. It could mean that, but not necessarily, because it depends upon the attitude of the vegetarian, not the diet of the vegetarian. And that's what Paul addresses next. Look at what he says in verse 3. Let not the one who eats, that is, the one who eats anything, 
Let him not despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains, that is the one who only eats vegetables, let him not pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Do you see what's going on here? You see what's going on in the church of Rome? The foodies were despising the vegetarians. And the vegetarians were passing judgment on the foodies. And so Paul says both are at fault. And he points to both groups and says, don't do that. He says, foodies, you, and vegetarians, you, knock it off. Stop passing judgment. Stop despising. Stop shaking your head in contempt and stop condemning your brothers and your sisters. So the Apostle Paul, Paul calls out both groups. He says, both of you are in the wrong and you need to stop. Both of you. But notice what happens next. The Apostle Paul focuses on the vegetarians and their condemnatory attitude. Both are in the wrong, but here the Apostle Paul focuses on the vegetarians and their judgmental attitude. But that does not mean that the foodies are off the hook. Only that they are put on the back burner until verse 14, which is when Paul will take aim at them and address their attitude as well. But look at verse four. Who are you, that is you vegetarians, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, reading this verse, it's almost as if the Apostle Paul was eavesdropping on a conversation that the foodies were having in the parking lot. It, it was as if Paul was standing over in the corner, at, at, I mean, the vegetarians. The vegetarians are over here. They're eating their carrot sticks and their hummus, and they're talking about the foodies. It, it's, it's as if they're saying, can you believe those guys? The things that they put in their bodies, don't they realize that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And, and they eat all of this stuff. And another person would say, yeah, I, I can't believe those guys. I, I bet they all have high cholesterol. They all have high blood pressure. Just a matter of time before they keel over of a stroke or a heart attack and develop diabetes. Those, those, those guys, they, they, they just need to do something about what, what they eat, what they put in their bodies. And so the Apostle Paul addresses that. He says, he, that is the foodie, will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. He's addressing the vegetarians and saying, if, if God wants to keep the foodies alive, those people that eat anything, if he wants to keep them alive, their diet won't kill them, right? They will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him to stand. And so Paul's point is not that vegetarianism is a sign of weak faith. Rather, it's the judgmental attitude of the vegetarian that makes him weak in faith. And that's because he has a misguided belief that eating only vegetables makes him more devout and more committed to God than the foodie. So let me say that again. The point is not that vegetarianism is a sign of weak faith. Rather, it is the judgmental vegetarian who is weak in faith because he believes that eating only vegetables makes him more devout and more committed to Christ than the foodie who eats anything. So it's the attitude, not the diet. 
The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. Food will not commend us to God. You're not going to have a better standing before the Lord based on what you eat or don't eat, right? We are no worse off, says the scripture, if we do not eat and no better off if we do. So what's the point? It's not the food, it's the attitude that is an indicator of weak faith. It's not the food, it's the attitude. But food was not the only issue. It's not the only example of weak faith in the church at Rome. That's why the Apostle Paul continues in verse 5 when he says this. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one, each person, should be fully convinced in his own mind. Now what Paul is getting at here is that in the ancient world there were all sorts of celebrations, festivals, and feast days that were observed by people. And these occasions were considered to be spiritually significant. They were things that were regarded as that you should participate in these things. There were, were Jewish occasions and there were pagan occasions. And so some of those people in the church at Rome said those days are significant. We've got to, we've got to honor them. And others said, eh, makes no difference to me. I can take it or I can leave it. And so in the ancient world, and two churches in particular, in Galatia and Colossae, that became an issue. And the Apostle Paul addressed it very specifically in his letters to those churches. Listen to what he says first to the church in Galatians in chapter 4. He says, Now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that I have labored over you in vain. Galatians 4 verses 9 through 11. So in the church in Galatia, you know, they were, they were battling legalism there. That they had to do certain practices, they had to observe certain things, and Paul says, you're getting bogged down in these days and months and seasons and years. Didn't I tell you that there's freedom in the gospel? You're going to become a slave again. And then to the church in Colossae, he says, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are all a shadow of the things to come, but the substance of which belongs to Christ. And so this practice of certain days, certain feasts, certain holidays, if you will, was an issue in the ancient world. It was a problem in Galatia, it was a problem in Colossae, but it doesn't appear to have become a problem yet in Rome. So Paul doesn't condemn them but rather gives them freedom to either participate or not participate. You have to be convinced in your own mind. Some paid attention to those cultural holidays and others ignored them. And it was not right or wrong to do it or to not do it, according to the Apostle Paul. Instead, he says it's a matter of conscience. You're free to observe are you free to ignore? As long as your conscience is clear and you're convinced in your own mind, you can do one or the other. And so bringing it into our modern day, 
What if someone wants to participate or attend the Chinese New Year parade? Or if someone wants to go and shoot off fireworks on the 4th of July? They're free to do that? Or they're free not to do that? You're not more or less Christian if you do or if you don't. It has nothing to do with following Christ and has no bearing on the kingdom of God. That's the Apostle Paul's point. That was the point then, that's the point now. We're free to observe or we're free not to observe. So the principle is this. Don't make an issue out of something that is not an issue to God. That's what the church at Rome was doing with food and with certain days. If scripture is silent on something and something is not forbidden, it's a matter of conscience and Christian liberty. It has nothing to do with our walk with the Lord. But the danger is to take a tradition, to take a cultural practice, to take a preference and make it a requirement or a test for being a fully devoted follower of Christ or a committed Christian. Right? None of those things are biblical tests for what it means to be a Christ follower or to be a child of God. They're matters of freedom and matters of liberty. I was reminded of a story that I had heard some time ago. I was watching a, a YouTube video on Charles Spurgeon. And we know that Charles Haddon Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers. He was known for being a preacher par excellence. I mean, at, as a teenager, he was preaching to hundreds and thousands of people. But later in life, he also became known for a particular habit that he had that was looked down upon by a number of people. You're nodding your head. You know what it is, Jim? Smoking cigars. Spurgeon liked to smoke cigars. And so he was often criticized and reviled for his habit of smoking cigars. You, a preacher of the gospel, smoke cigars. Well, one day when he was being criticized for his habit, the historical record says that Spurgeon addressed those folks and said, you know what I'm going to do this day? I'm going to go home and I'm going to light up my cigar and I'm going to smoke it to the glory of God. <laughs> How could Spurgeon say something like that? Because cigars are not addressed in scripture, right? They're not condemned and they're not condoned. It's a matter of Christian liberty. It's a matter of freedom. And so that was Spurgeon's perspective. It's not an issue to God. It's not an issue for me. I'm going to smoke my stogie to the honor of the Lord. I probably didn't use the word stogie. <laughs> but uh, he said, I'm going to enjoy my cigar and I'm going to smoke it until I've had enough. And then tomorrow I'm going to light up a note. <laughs> and that is the test. It's a matter of conscience. Smoking cigars didn't bother Charles Spurgeon's conscience, and so he was able to smoke his cigar and not feel bad about it. And so the test of being convinced in one's mind and the clear conscience is how we can determine whether or not we should or should not do something. Look at what Paul says in verse 6. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. Now notice the phrase there. Three times it's repeated in honor of the Lord. Those who are called weak in faith, who hold to certain days and celebrations, 
They observe those occasions in honor of the Lord. Those who eat anything and everything, those foodies, they eat in honor of the Lord and thank him for their hot dogs and their hamburgers and their baby back ribs. While those who abstain from certain practices and certain foods, they abstain from those in honor of the Lord, thanking him for their veggies and their freedom not to participate. So those who practice and those who abstain, those who eat and those who don't eat, are all doing it for the same reason, in honor of the Lord. Their conscience says, I can't eat that. I'm honoring the Lord by not eating that. The foodies say, <laughs> call nothing unclean that the Lord made. I'm, I'm going I'm to have a second helping. Anybody got a sharp knife? I'm going to cut my steak thinner so I can eat more faster. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of liberty. And again, Paul's point is that the born-again believer does everything with Christ in view. Jesus is the one who they are honoring by eating, not eating, observing, or abstaining. The Christ follower is to do everything in honor of the Lord. And the Apostle Paul drives that home in verses 7 and 8. Look at what he says in verses 7 and verse 8. He says, none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Paul has both groups in mind here, both the strong and the weak. And then he includes himself in the group as well. He says, us. None of us who are following Christ, he says, lives or dies independent of Jesus. Christ is our focal point, Paul says. He is the one that we are focusing our attention on. He is the one that we're practicing or not practicing for. We are doing it to honor him in life and in death. Whether we live or whether we die, Christ is our view and Christ is our aim Christ is our end. We live to please and honor him so that we might die well. Right? That was a phrase that the Puritans used, dying well. That is, dying with a clear conscience as a result of clean living. And it had nothing to do with what they did or didn't do necessarily. It was whether or not they were honoring the Lord with what they were doing or with what they were abstaining from. They wanted to die well. And when we die, we fully expect to meet the Lord, whether we eat or don't eat, because we belong to the Lord. The vegetarians and the foodies, those who honor the, the days and those that don't, all together belong to the Lord. And that's what Paul says in verse 9. Look at verse 9. For to this end Christ died and lived again that, or in order that, he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. To this end, Christ died. To what end? To the end of making us his people. To the end of making us the sheep of his pasture. To the end of making us citizens of God's kingdom, people of his inheritance. To that end, Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. It is the death and the life of Christ that makes us children of God. For he is our propitiation, right? His life and death purchased our redemption. It achieves our reconciliation to the Father. It guarantees our justification and secures our salvation. Because the Lord died and rose again, he is Lord while we're walking on this earth, and he is Lord when we breathe our last breath and we are absent from the body and go home to be with him. He is Lord of the living, and he is Lord of the dead. 
And having reminded the believers of this truth, Paul then returns to where he started in verse 10. He gave two imperatives in verse 3, and in verse 10, he returns to those imperatives, but he, he addresses them in the form of a rhetorical question. So look at verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? Paul's asking a question, but again, look, he's, he's addressing the attitudes of being judgmental and despising. Why do you vegetarians and you holiday observers pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you foodies and you non-participants, why do you despise your brother? Paul asked a question, but it's a rhetorical question, right? Because he told them earlier, don't do this. Don't judge, don't despise. Having laid out the case why that's wrong, he now is beginning to wrap up the argument and he asked the question, well, why are you doing that? It's, a, it's a, an indirect way of saying, I've told you before, I'm telling you again, cut that out. Don't do that. Don't judge and don't despise. Because such judgment, that, that contempt is not becoming of a child of God. It's not loving your neighbor as yourself, and it's not presenting yourself to the Lord as the living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto the Lord. And so don't do that any longer. And then he gives us a reason why despising and being judgmental are both wrong. He spells out not only why it's wrong, but why it's unnecessary. And he starts with the second half of verse 10 and goes through verse 12 with a reason. For we all, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. In other words, Christ is the final judge. You're not the judge. I'm not the judge. Stop judging. Christ is the judge. We're all going to stand before him. Everyone is going to give an account of their life, whether you're weak or strong, whether you're elder or deacon, whether you're male or female, everybody, as the Lord lives, will bow before the Lord and give an account of himself to God. Everything that we do or don't do is going to be laid bare before him. Jesus said that every idle word is going to be uh, judged by him. And as a result of what we say, what we do, what we don't do, we're going to be rewarded or not accordingly. And so Paul concludes, he wraps up this entire argument here by saying very plainly, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. The bottom line, as Paul started, so he concludes, is to embrace, to accept, and to receive one another no matter where they are in their spiritual journey, no matter how strong or how weak in the faith, faith they are, there's no room for condemnation, there's no room for contempt. The strong must be willing to lay aside their freedoms for the weak. Are you allowed to eat hamburgers and hot dogs? Sure you are. But if your brother or sister doesn't want to eat hot dogs and hamburgers and, and insist on only vegetables, then don't shun them. Embrace them. Let them eat their vegetables, their carrot sticks, and their celery sticks, and, and, and their roasted vegetables to the glory of God in honor of Him. And the weak must not refrain from imposing their standards upon the rest of the body and use that as a test or a club 
to get people to conform to them. Right? It, it works both ways. The weak and the strong are all part of the same body of Christ and must live together, love one another, and practice acceptance and love and being that living sacrifice to the Lord. That's Paul's point. Don't make spiritual mountains out of molehills. Don't make an issue out of something that God does not say is an issue. Allow people the freedom to honor their conscience, to eat or not eat, to practice or not practice. So long as the Lord doesn't forbid it, it's okay. That's the point of Romans 14, 1 through 13. Now, I need to add a brief addendum here. This is not part of the message, but this is a thought that occurred to me as Paul concluded his argument by saying, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. I, I read that phrase, and I'm afraid that some will read that and mistakenly conclude that all judgment is wrong. That there is no room at any time in any place for the Christian to be judgmental. And that is simply not the case. There is a time and there is a place for being judgmental. And I'm gonna share that in just a moment. But the type of judgment that Paul is denouncing here is the same type of judgment that Jesus denounced in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter seven. Right, that's the verse that we memorize together, right? And why am I drawing a blank? I can't remember it. <laughs> Judge not that you be not judged. Right? For with the... For the measure you use, it will be measured to use. And with the judgment you pronounce, you will, you will be judged. You hypocrite, right? Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First remove the speck from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the log, log. The log from your own eye. Brother's eye. Brother's eye. We need to get back to memorizing our scripture. <laughs> but the point there is, there is no room for being self-righteous in your judgment. That's what Jesus condemned. That's what Paul is condemning here. But there is a time and a place when it is right to render judgment. And that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And so if you still have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn there and look at the first three verses and the last three verses. There's only 13 verses in 1 Corinthians 5, and it addresses this idea of, of Paul's judgment upon this church at this time, upon this particular individual. But I just want to read six verses out of the 13. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 3 says this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. And then verse 11. Now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Now, I mentioned earlier, we're not to make issues where God doesn't make an issue. But, but, 
If something is an issue to God, such as those things that are mentioned here in this passage, sexual immorality, drunkenness, greed, idolatry, and so on, we by all means need to raise the issue if those things are being practiced in the church and among people who call themselves brothers and Christian, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We not only have to raise the issue, we need to expose the sin. Otherwise, it's impossible to practice church discipline and there's no way to police ourselves. And I think of this not so much as judgment, though that's what Paul calls it. It's primarily Christian accountability, right? It, it's calling one another to live the life that God has called us to live. Not an antinomia, not a, a, a reckless, uh, do-as-you-will lifestyle. Because God still has standards of behavior for his people. We are to live in a way that honors him. And that's what Paul said, right? The, they, the people that ate, the people that didn't, and so on, they did that in honor of the Lord. Well, our life is to be lived in honor of the Lord. And these vices, these sinful practices are dishonoring to the Lord. And so if we know that those are going on, it is our responsibility to call them out as the Apostle Paul did here. And so while Paul says, let not those that are weak pass judgment, he himself here is passing judgment because there was a practice that threatened the, the life of the church in Corinth. So he calls it out and he condemns it because God condemns that practice as well. And so in a nutshell, there is a time and there is a place to be judgmental. It is within the body of Christ in the church when sin is blatant and needs to be exposed and a person needs to be corrected and brought back to repentance in submission to the Lord. So that's all I want to say about judgment. Self-righteous judgment is wrong. Christian biblical judgment according to God's standards is right and appropriate and needs to be practiced on a regular basis when necessary. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, your word is always instructive. And Father, we thank you for the teaching that you gave us this morning through your servant, the apostle, as he wrote under the inspiration of your spirit to welcome the weaker brother, to embrace him, to love him, to accept him, and not condemn the Christian for what they eat or don't eat, do or don't do, so long as you don't condemn them. Father, give us the wisdom and the discernment, the patience and the compassion to put this passage into practice, to know what is and what is not allowed according to your word. Thank you for our time this morning, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for the treasure of the scripture. In Christ's name we pray.